Amen. Christ is risen. Indeed, that's the Presbyterian word for amen. How, uh, let me say Christ is risen and you say amen. Ready? Christ is risen. Amen. amen. With our Arise congregation, it's almost like a code. If you say hallelujah, you answer with amen. Hallelujah. Amen. amen. A couple of weeks ago, uh, one of the guys in our weekly Thursday men's Bible studies uh, admitted that a few worships ago, uh, he wanted to say amen out loud, but didn't know if it was appropriate. And so we all jumped on him. Of course, amen is yes. Uh, and so um, I want us today is an amen to the 23rd Psalm. Amen? amen. What? Amen. All right. Come on. Come on. Amen means so be it. Uh, uh, often in the New Testament, in the Gospels, when Jesus says, verily, yes, I say to you, in the original language, it's amen, amen. Jesus' way of saying amen, amen, listen up. So amen is a yes, yes. And uh, today is the second Sunday of Eastertide. Uh, a great little name, Eastertide. Uh, in fact, I think every day for the Christian year-round is Eastertide. Amen? Amen? All right. All right. And today we are practicing that tradition which uh, I cherish, we cherish, reading the names of our church family who have been promoted to glory. Uh, saints go marching in. And so today I want us to continue to think about Christ's resurrection, Christ's royal reign as the King of Kings. And today we are bringing to a close our 23rd Psalm series uh, with an Amen worship service uh, that looks at Jesus as King. Um, and, and as we've been saying along, the best way to understand the 23rd Psalm is to be aware of and read Psalm 22 before it and Psalm 24 after it. It's a kind of trilogy in my mind. On March 2nd, uh, Ash Wednesday, the beginning of the Lenten season, here that night we read Psalm 22, which precedes Psalm 23. It is the Psalm of the Suffering Servant, which Jesus quoted for himself from the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's a psalm of God's suffering servant who anoints and brings salvation hope. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. Psalm 22 is the work of God's servant which allows us today to journey on Psalm 23 with a shepherd who guides us to green pastures, waters of refreshment, even making a table for us before our enemies, right up to the cross of his shame, but yet victory. As we saw last week on Easter, the shepherd who enables us to live in the house of the Lord forever. And so today as we wrap up this series, it's good for us to look at the psalm that follows. It's an amen psalm of royal reign and victory, Psalm 24. We go from the suffering servant of Psalm 22, the guiding good shepherd of Psalm 23, to the risen and ascended King of Kings, our reigning Savior of Psalm 24. And so I'd like for us to read it together, and uh, you'll have a part to play. Psalm 24 is a pilgrimage song. Uh, people would recite Psalm 24 on their way to worship, walking up to the temple. And uh, there's a couple places where for hundreds of years there was a call and response where the people would ask from the wall, uh, who goes? And there would be an answer from below as they would open the door to admit people to worship. So um, uh, verses 8 and 10, you have a part to say out loud. Are you ready? Yeah, and it'll say people. That's your cue. 
The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god, they will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God their Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he? Is he in the, Lord? the Lord Almighty. He is the King of glory. God, we thank you for this reading of your psalm, your scripture. Help us now, Holy Spirit to rely on you, to listen for you, and to follow you in faith. Jesus, in your name we pray. Amen. All hail, the king is coming. Attention, pay attention, sit up straight, be ready. That's sort of the function of Psalm 24. Do you know that royal presence is coming before you? Some years back, I attended worship at Bel Air Presbyterian Church in California. And I won't forget it, uh, I finally got into worship about 10 minutes late because of the U.S. Secret Service. They were out in the parking lot. We commoners were not allowed even on the property until President Ronald and Nancy Reagan uh, went. They had attended the earlier service, and Limousine One was pulling away, and traffic was backed up down the street. It kind of gave us a thrill. Someone important had been in worship. Someone important is always in worship. Amen? Amen. All right. So the question is, how did the likes of us get in here today? Right? What did you and I do to be admitted to God's royal presence? This is a sanctuary reserved for holy, reverent worship. And you know, Psalm 24 asks us to think of our place. How are we admitted to God's royal presence? You know, it was just a year ago that we were carefully counting how many could come and be in worship. It was just a year ago that we were pretty crazy intent about sanitizers and cleanliness, masking, vaccination. And thank you, Lord, we have come such a long way over a year. I know we still must remain careful. I know that some still have to remain online because of their health situation. But I thank God that we've made such progress in being able to be together in person, but also online. Psalm 24 is asking us about clean hands and those of us who have a clean heart. And beyond that, Psalm 24 is parade poetry. As I said, it's a pilgrim song that people would sing or at least say as they walked up the steps to Jerusalem to worship. And it poses this question, by what right can we enter the Lord's presence? It's important, friends, for us to remember in worship that we can only come into the presence of God by right of holiness and that God comes to us in his divine presence by his own uh, right of sovereignty, glory, and power. We should notice how this psalm begins. God is God. And if God is truly God then he is the master of this world and all who live in it. You know, one of my favorite hymns 
uh, in just a week or so, we're going to start a hymn series, is This Is My Father's World. I love that song because it's true. This whole world belongs to God. And Psalm 24 verse 1 sings, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Do you remember this? God owns you. God owns this earth. It's his. Did you know God owns your house? I love young generations when they finally get their first house. They, well, we, we now own our own home. And you know, the clothes crawler is, I think the bank maybe owns it. <laughs> Check with me in 25 years, right? But God owns your house and the land it sits on, right? God owns the air you breathe. And you know, God owns that heart pump embedded in the center of your body. Pretty amazing organ. Circulates that blood. God is a breathtaking, breath-receiving, exhilarating pause of life. In the original Hebrew of Psalm 24, the very first word is Yahweh. God. God is first. God is the one who wins. Some years back, my crazy brother gave me this book, a silly little funny book, Who Would Win? <laughs> it's a guide to the great imaginary showdowns of life. Utterly silly. But it, it makes you think, well, who would win in showdowns? For example, uh, who is the greatest painter of all time? Is it Pablo Picasso or Vincent van Gogh? How many vote Picasso? Oh, okay. How many vote Van Gogh? Okay. How many are holding out for Rembrandt? <laughs> Good. Good. Let's do one more, uh, or two more maybe. Uh, who would battle, who would win the battle of beverages, tea or coffee? How many tea? Okay. All right. How many coffee? For all of you who love tea, we love the British, and we love you. Okay. Let's do one more. I wish I could take photographs of this election. This is really interesting as your pastor. Uh, which is the best puzzle of all time, crosswords or Sudoku? Okay. Sudoku? All right. I see your hands. Crosswords? All right, I think crosswords wins. All right. This has been a great waste of... I... I bring this up because in life, friends, who will win? God. It's not even a close match. And sometimes we can speak and think in arrogance. What will I do this weekend? Will I go to church or not? My weekend is kind of busy. Oh, do you remember who owns you? Who gives us life? Who gives us life beyond death? Psalm 24, 3 asks, Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy presence? I don't know about you, but these words give me cause to pause. And the value of reading the Old Testament, one of the values, is remembering the awesome power and holiness of our living God. When Moses brought down the Ten Commandment tablets from the mountain, remember there were clear warnings and boundaries for the people to protect them from God's dangerous presence. And throughout the life of the Hebrew people, for years, only one priest was allowed to go into the very holy of holies in the temple. Only one because it was such an incredibly awesome experience to come before God. They would even tie a rope around his ankle in case that associate pastor died. They could drag out his body and others would not be harmed for real. And so David here in this pilgrim song is wanting to prepare people to get ready to come before God the King in worship. 
And he references here points, I call them reference points of encountering God's presence and peace, which we need to keep in mind. And they relate to our hands, uh, our heart, and our head. First off, in terms of hands, we need to be living in a way of making choices of cleanliness. Um, you know, if you, if you just think about it, We've, we've recently earned a two-and-a-half-year associate's degree in hand cleanliness, haven't we? What, you used to think you knew how to wash your hands, right? And now even to this day, we're singing dopey little songs to keep us soaping up a little longer, and we're, we're just, we're starting to act like surgeons, and now we know how to turn faucets on and off with our elbows. We know how to open doors with our feet good times. Sometimes I go into a restaurant like, you know, like this. Yeah. Psalm 24 is asking us to think about the choices we make with our hands. And that's because we use our hands with a lot of our behavior choices. I love the guy who made a comment in a restaurant's restroom uh, there was a sign that said, employees must wash hands. And he said, you know, I waited and waited, but no one came, so I washed them myself. Well, before there was Dr. Fauci, there was Dr. Bible. Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands. And the word for clean here in Hebrew is a word that can also mean pure or innocent. Beyond epidermal purity, the idea here is a concern for moral cleanliness that relates to our hands. Because with our hands, we show our choices. We volunteer. VBS, count on me. We make selections. We choose to help someone. We also activate or swipe right or swipe left with our hands. And I have to remind you, for the last two and a half years, friends, we have witnessed the impact of a microscopic germ, a germ we can't see, and the havoc it has caused in this world, tragically for many, leading to death. Can we stop and appreciate in our Father's world how there is continuing damage from what might seem like hidden germs of immorality, idolatry, and soul sickness that can arise from the choices we make. And so a Christian way to cleanse our hands is to routinely pray prayers of confession. We Christ followers pray in confession uh, to confess our errors and mistakes, even those sins we cannot be aware of. I was once asked as a pastor, why do we need to keep confessing our sins to God if Christ forgives us once and for all? And the answer is pretty simple. It's for our own health. It's not to be justified by God all over again, but to be aided by God for living in more and more healthy ways for our sake and the sake of people in our lives. Confessing your sin in prayer is the proper response of a wayward child to a loving and gracious parent who wants us to learn and grow from our errors. When we confess our sin in worship, we are not saying, Jesus, I'm a failure all over again. Please save me all over again. No, we're saying, I am sorry, Lord. Please clean me up and help me to avoid the dirt. That's how we experience God's peace and presence. Secondly, the psalm is inviting us to live with hearts that have a singleness of devotion. Psalm 24 calls uh, the, these hearts that are pure, and it makes me think of Soren Kierkegaard. He's a Danish theologian, and he's the one who said that purity of heart is to will one thing. It's to live with a spiritual centeredness and aim on the reigning God of this world. Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust 
in an idol or swear by a false god. You know, your heart in your body has one key function, and that is to routinely, relentlessly carry oxygen-carrying blood to every cell in you so that you live. And a heart of purity for God has one focus of serving God, living for his glory. And it's difficult to multitask God. We find heart health in our living when we focus on giving God the glory and following his lead. And friends, please, I say this to you as an inveterate uh, multitasker. Uh, I will admit to you, one of my heroes in life is the Swiss Army knife. So many useful tools, right? But when you make a habit to grow in your spiritual focus, to enjoy God's goodness, to live for his glory and serve his kingdom means, we begin to find that health and peace. Thirdly, the psalm directs us to have heads that are lifted up with a focus of glory. Have you all noticed what our smartphones have done to our necks? Right? Go through an airport someday or a mall. Count how many people are doing this. Not noticing who's going by. I really like the people who walk like this. Yeah. No. The psalm is saying, God is in your life. Look up. Be aware of the spirit around you. Heads up. Don't look down. Uh, because, friends, you know how when we're caught in error or shame, we're tempted just to look down and to start quitting on ourselves. I mean, I, we even see it in our animals. I've got some pictures of dogs here caught in error really quickly. I like the taste of Samsung remote controls. This one tasted better than the last one. He's not a happy dog. The next one? I ate the toilet paper during the pandemic. Not a happy doodle right there. Next one, I chewed through the main cable cord, so now mama and daddy have no TV in the house until Wednesday. Look how sad he is. Right, one more. This book survived World War II, but not me. It's a French phrase book. We. Oui. Those dogs are not looking up or happy. They know what mistakes and error are. But friends, with our grace, gracious God, this is not our only posture in life. No, the psalmist looks forward to the reigning king. Lift up your heads, you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is he, this king of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is the king of glory. I've got to ask you, has your head just been downcast lately? Have you been drooping these days? And do you need someone to come alongside of you to lift up your vision? Who will win in your life? And how will you leave here from worship today? Who will win? Is it going to be Andy or God? Well, the real answer is both. Because our God rules in this world and rules with steadfast love, amazing grace. God will win, but you and I can win as well. Friends, with our hearts, hands, and heads, above all, we can stand before God in grace. Who may stand in his holy place is the question of Psalm 24. And I would direct you to our baptismal font. It's a symbol in this sanctuary of that washing spirit of Christ. Our hands are not as clean as we think they are, but in Christ the stains are washed away. Our hearts are not pure, but the Holy Spirit continually redirects our focus. Our heads and eyes are at times downcast, but Jesus wants us to see his cross, to see his empty tomb. In Jesus, we have someone from the line of the King David who stood in our place, 
who received our penalties, who cleanses us by his blood, and who rose from the dead to offer us life. Amen? Amen. They will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God their Savior. That's how we stand in God's presence and glory. I have to tell you, one of my favorite movie scenes is from the movie To Kill a Mockingbird. In one of the closing scenes, there's been a courtroom trial, a trial in which Tom Robinson, a black man, is wrongly accused of raping a white woman. And Atticus Finch is his defense attorney, played by Gregory Peck. And he's preparing, he's closing up his briefcase, he's preparing to walk out of the courtroom because he's lost the case. The jury found Robinson guilty anyway. But portrayed up in the balcony of that courtroom, in those days, that's where the black folks were required to sit as he's preparing to walk out. They all begin to stand. And Atticus Finch's little girl, Scout, is up there with them. And the local pastor, Reverend Sykes, along with all the black folks, they stand up. And he bends over to this little girl. And he says, Miss Jean Louise, stand up. Your father's passing. Your father is passing by. Stand up. He's fought the good fight. He stands for us. He stands for justice. You can see it in the scene. Respect is given to the one who comes for us. Friends, as we gather in worship, we can stand up because of the mercy of God's reigning king and servant who came for us. Jesus is our defense against the worst prosecutor we could ever face. We are guilty. Our hands, our hearts, our heads, they are not clean enough for us to go up on God's holy mountain, but we can stand now and live each day for the one who makes us holy, whole, healed. Let us pray. And can we stand and pray? Gracious God, Heavenly Father, Jesus, Prince of Peace, Holy Spirit, Comforter, Counselor, guide us in our daily living to stand before you, to receive your mercy, forgiveness, and grace. And Jesus put within us, in even bigger ways, the promptings and desire to live a life that honors you, that gives glory to you, and that shines your light, which is from you. Hail, King of Kings, Jesus, in your name we pray and rejoice. Amen.